Good evening, I'm Ian Hanamancy. Many struggling Canadians are about to get help. If you choose to direct deposit, you will get a first payment within three to five days. But with an onslaught of applications expected, will the system work? The Queen's historic address in the midst of the pandemic. We will succeed, and that success will belong to every one of us. Should you be wearing a mask outside? Our doctors will talk us through the pros and pitfalls. Plus, made in Canada solutions to medical equipment shortages. Our supply chain is all in Canada. We're not at risk if, you know, if things change elsewhere. How companies are working together to help. This is The National. The fight against COVID-19 in Canada comes down to time and resolve. How long and how well can this country outrun the virus by staying in one place? So far, the pace of infection remains relentless, as Canada's chief health officer said today. You won't know that you've passed the, a, a certain peak until you're actually on the other side of it. There are more than 15,500 confirmed cases in Canada, about 1,500 of those new today. Deaths have now passed the 300 mark. As we've often been reminded, this isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. But time is money, and many Canadians are rapidly running out of it. The first program announced by the government to help launches tomorrow. People could start getting money as early as this week. But as Ashley Burke explains, this is a hastily arranged program bearing a big burden. Anytime we're doing big measures like this, there will be gaps, there will be challenges in implementation and unforeseen consequences. The Prime Minister is about to launch one of the most needed and anticipated economic relief programs in Canadian history. And he says the system is ready to go. We are working very hard to ensure that uh, our systems are robust enough to uh, handle the unprecedented demand. CERB was built from scratch at a time of crisis. It's now depending on the Canada Revenue Agency's IT systems to quickly get money to those in need. Governments have a terrible record of bungling information technology systems and that can result in payment delays and wrong amounts being sent out. We hope that uh, CRA has uh, managed to plan for this. The test will come Monday morning when hundreds of thousands of Canadians log on to apply. Away. Including this Quebec dad who lost both of his jobs. I hope it's not so long because uh, this week, I need to call my bank uh, to, to stop payment for my cars, for my house. As some wait for the benefits, students and anyone who still has any income are left out entirely. The concern is that um, this group of people who um, did not have a job and lose a job uh, at the beginning of COVID-19 don't qualify for the CERB. The emergency response benefit effectively bans workers from taking on any extra hours. If they work and earn any money during the period when they're receiving the benefit, they lose the benefit altogether. This is the first wave of government aid that will be followed by an even bigger wage subsidy program for businesses. All of this is being done at a pace and a speed that has stressed the people who need this program, the people building it, and the computer system delivering it. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. In Britain tonight, the Queen delivered a rallying cry in response to the pandemic. It was one of the rare times that she's addressed the Commonwealth with a special message, and she did it with a call for unity. Margaret Evans was watching. From the inner sanctum of Windsor Castle and the deep familiarity of Britain's longest reigning monarch to a nation living through such unfamiliar times, the Queen's message was clearly aimed at delivering hope and reassurance. While we have faced challenges before, this one is different. This time we join with all nations across the globe in a common endeavour. It is only the fifth time that the Queen has felt compelled to make such a broadcast over her 68-year reign during the first Gulf War, after the deaths of Princess Diana and her own mother, and to mark 60 years on the throne. She's effectively trying to be alongside her subjects in their living rooms while they are self-isolating and social distancing, trying to basically provide a chink of hope and a chink of light at a difficult time. I, have a, I still have a temperature. And so Tonight, just after the Queen's address, the British Prime Minister Boris Johnson, diagnosed with COVID-19 10 days ago, was taken to hospital for what Downing Street is describing as precautionary tests. 
Nearly 5,000 people have now died of the coronavirus here. The government is building vast field hospitals and morgues. And yet this weekend's sunny weather still managed to challenge orders for people to stay inside and when allowed outside for exercise, to stay apart. Today, the British Health Secretary said that if people don't follow the social distancing guidelines, he may be forced to close the parks, maybe even forbid people from exercising outside at all. And those self-isolating may at Tonight, the Queen issued her own challenge to Britons, thanking not just frontline healthcare workers, but those who were staying at home to protect the vulnerable and to spare more families pain. Better days, she said, will return. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Well, as we saw, the Queen's address to the Commonwealth is a rarity, and her words at times evoke the spirit of the Second World War. Here's more of what she said for the record. It reminds me of the very first broadcast I made in 1940, helped by my sister. We as children spoke from here at Windsor to children who had been evacuated from their homes and sent away for their own safety. Today, once again, many will feel a painful sense of separation from their loved ones. But now as then, we know deep down that it is the right thing to do. While we have faced challenges before, this one is different. This time we join with all nations across the globe in a common endeavor using the great advances of science and our instinctive compassion to heal. We will succeed, and that success will belong to every one of us. We should take comfort that while we may have more still to endure, better days will return. We will be with our friends again. We will be with our families again. We will meet again. But for now, I send my thanks and warmest good wishes to you all. Here in communities across Canada, lots of developments in the COVID-19 story. Nova Scotia is set to ramp up testing in outbreak areas. Well, we now know that this disease is in our communities. This will include a mobile assessment centre and at-home testing. In Quebec, there were an additional 950 cases and 19 new deaths. The province has now extended the shutdown of non-essential services for at least another month. The battle is far from over. And a Walmart security guard in Sherbrooke, Quebec, is in critical condition after he was hit by a car last night. The driver allegedly frustrated with the physical distancing measures in place at the store. Hundreds of members of the Canadian military are moving to a base in Borden, Ontario, ready to assist if needed. And a worrisome trend continues in Alberta. A majority of the province's deaths are happening in long-term care homes. Physical distancing is a message governments and health officials keep trying to relay. And many cities are now enforcing stricter regulations, but not everyone is listening. Here's Talia Ricci with a look at the consequences. Signs of spring tempt Canadians. But caution tape, warning signs and now in-person enforcement are reminders of reality. If you go up on the sidewalk, you can meet the trail again further on, but you can't go down that way. And also the consequences for those failing to follow physical distancing rules. I think that the fines are definitely justified. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and we have to take our health and safety seriously. Officers were visible in parks and other gathering places across the country this weekend, including Nova Scotia, where dozens of tickets were issued province-wide. I was pleased to hear, but surprised, uh, law enforcement had to issue the number of tickets they were issuing this weekend. Uh, and if required, we'll step up enforcement. In Vancouver, breaking the rules can mean up to a $50,000 fine for businesses or up to $1,000 for individuals. I just want to thank you guys for so in Toronto, the fine can go up to $5,000 if the case goes to court. The city's new physical distancing bylaw states that any two people who don't live together and who fail to keep two meters apart in a park or public square could be ticketed. I think it's like incredibly important to be a good citizen at this time. 
And over the weekend, a blitz in Toronto focused on parks, which police say are hot spots. On Saturday alone, between this park and one other, more than 1,000 vehicles were turned away. Ten tickets were issued across the city, and more than 1,000 people were spoken to about the rules. This enforcement will continue daily. Officers will talk with those individuals and try to educate them in regards to the things they can and cannot do. But if the public doesn't heed the warnings, fines will follow. Talia Ricci, CBC News, Toronto. More Canadians are coming home, and today that included flights from India. It hasn't been easy or cheap, with ticket prices of nearly $3,000. Still, as Tina Lovegreen tells us, there are thousands more hoping to catch the next plane home. I mean, I consider myself lucky that I'm even on this flight. Gurkreet Kular is relieved to be at the airport in New Delhi, waiting to board his flight to Vancouver. But getting to even this point has been a logistical nightmare. Up until last night, until we got the tickets, it was just constant checking on the phone, checking the Facebook, Facebook group to check what other people were getting. A lot of people weren't even getting emails. He says the travel agency that booked the flights was disorganized, didn't even issue tickets until the morning of the flight. Then there was the seven-hour bus ride to the airport. 30 degrees outside, people were frustrated, yelling, as you can see from the video. The bus was actually full. They were told to get off and wait for another bus. But still, he's grateful. He was able to pay nearly $10,000 to get himself and his parents on one of the flights organized by the Canadian government. More than 27,000 Canadian citizens in India have registered with Global Affairs. And while it's unclear how many actually want to return home, Canada's Foreign Affairs Minister says there's no way they can help everyone get out. Though they are adding more flights. We have uh, decided that there will be flights from Armistar in Bangalore because we understand there's a cluster of Canadians uh, who want to come back home. And Amritsar is about an hour and a half away from where my parents are versus uh, the Delhi airport, which was probably about seven hours away. The additional flights bringing hope to Nav Jower, who has been trying to get his parents back home to BC for three weeks now. I honestly hope I just get this phone call or email so we can actually book the tickets. Knowing well, the logistics of getting them home won't be easy. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. Americans are being told to brace for a bad week, possibly the worst in the coronavirus pandemic. Tonight, there are more than 335,000 known cases, 9,500 deaths, nearly a quarter of those in New York City. And as Paul Hunter tells us, the city is bracing for that count to get a lot higher. <laughs> At New York's St. Patrick's Cathedral, a virtual Palm Sunday Mass streamed online today from an empty cathedral for parishioners watching at home, physically distancing in a city that remains the epicenter of the COVID crisis in America. And on a day when more sobering images emerged of the latest ad hoc morgue, this one in Brooklyn, word the ever-growing death toll in this country will this week likely turn even worse. Things are going to get bad and we need to be prepared for that. It is going to be shocking to some. Anthony Fauci, the Trump administration's lead scientist on this, today explained that even though both infections and deaths in New York this weekend seemed for the first time to slow down, so many of those already ill are gravely so. So we just buckle down, continue to mitigate, continue to do the physical separation because we got to get through this week that's coming up because it is going to be a bad week. Or as the U.S. Surgeon General put it. This is going to be our Pearl Harbor moment, our 9-11 moment, only it's not going to be localized. It's going to be happening all over the country. That said, tonight Donald Trump tried to paint a more optimistic picture. We're starting to see light at the end of the tunnel. Underlining that despite the horrific death count anticipated in the days ahead, it may be that social distancing in America, as well as other steps, is beginning to have an effect. You can never be happy when so many people are dying, but we're going to be very proud of the job we did to keep the death down to an absolute minimum, the least it could have happened. Trump's been criticized before for being overly optimistic on all of this, but indeed tonight, 
He also suggested the overall death count in America ultimately may not be as high as his own experts have predicted, though even he noted tonight it will be horrific. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. And one more development from the United States coming to us late this evening. The Bronx Zoo announced that one of its tigers tested positive for COVID-19. Apparently the animal caught it from an asymptomatic worker and other tigers are showing symptoms as well. So let's bring in a familiar face to our viewers, infectious disease expert, Dr. Lenora Saxinger, joining us from Edmonton. I know this uh, sent you to the books to do some reading or at least the computer. Uh, does it change our thinking about whether pets can get COVID-19 or even pass it on to us? Well, we've already gone through the dog question. It looks like dogs are not very good hosts for this virus, although they might be able to carry it. They don't appear to get that sick. Um, and after I heard about the tiger, I found that there has been a recent publication looking at giving the infection to cats on purpose using a fairly high amount of virus. And in that case, the cats didn't get terribly sick, but they did carry the virus and were able to pass it to other cats in close quarters. And so it, it's going to be an evolving question, but based on that study, it doesn't look highly likely that we're going to have to worry about cats being a cause for transmission in the community. Um, but you might want to be a little bit more cautious about having like close face-to-face -face contact with your cat if you're sick. All right. Dr. Saxinger, we'll see you in a few moments for our regular Your Questions panel. CBC News has been tracking every confirmed case of COVID-19 in Canada. You can check it out online, cbc.ca slash coronavirus tracker. Now, of all the numbers we're watching, the most accurate measure of the pandemic may be the number of people who are in intensive care. That's where patients get life-saving support, sometimes including ventilators. Those beds are a limited resource as provinces rush to expand capacity. Up-to-date figures can be hard to find, but here are ICU beds reportedly available in the provinces facing the largest outbreaks. And here, the number of patients filling them at last count. The worry, of course, the coming wave in Ontario and Quebec. The number of COVID patients in the ICU has been rising rapidly. Catherine Cullen tells us how doctors are already bracing for the tragic decisions they'll have to make if beds and equipment run out. Deciding which sick, suffering person gets a bed in intensive care at some Parisian hospitals isn't easy. It could be the difference between life and death. It's a stress to be forced to make choices we don't want to make, says this doctor. A stress doctors in Italy and the U.S. are facing, something Canadians are now thinking about too. I, I think it is only prudent to be prepared for the, for the possibility that we are going to be facing a very similar scenario in the coming days or weeks. Not having enough intensive care beds or ventilators is a worst case scenario that everyone is trying to avoid. But provinces are drawing up guidelines to help make those tough decisions. Ontario's work was led by Dr. James Downer. Uh, again, we are trying as hard as we can to make sure that if we have to exclude anybody from critical care, it would be people who would be the most likely to, to die despite our best efforts. So health would be a deciding factor, but he says a patient's age shouldn't be. Because it's very hard to defend a specific age limit. The decisions are gut-wrenching, they are heartbreaking. The Canadian Medical Association is also working on guidelines for doctors and says as healthcare workers fighting this disease fall ill, there is an argument for ensuring that they are among those who get life-saving care. They have put themselves in harm's way um, and, and they are also going to be needed to come back to continue to uh, practice their profession. The idea is that a team of doctors or perhaps even a committee would be the ones making these difficult decisions and that all patients would still get medical care even if only some would have access to the ventilators that could save their lives. Catherine Cullen, CBC News, Ottawa. And a woman who fought for the health care system her father helped found has died tonight. Activist and actress Shirley Douglas had been battling pneumonia. Her son, Kiefer Sutherland, says it was not connected to COVID-19. Douglas was briefly married to Donald Sutherland, and her father was founding NDP leader Tommy Douglas. Shirley Douglas was 86.
Canada's chief public health officer says new guidelines on masks are coming. We are actively uh, reviewing the evidence right now. Up next on The National, the great mask debate goes on. Our experts weigh in. Plus, rideshare or transit, the safest way to get around during a pandemic in our latest COVID-19 how-to guide. And all hands on deck inside the Canadian businesses rapidly pivoting to supply healthcare workers. We're back right after this. Welcome back. Well, during this COVID-19 pandemic, Canadians are looking for ways to best protect themselves, and that's leading to a lot of questions about the use of masks. Here's some of what Canada's chief medical officer had to say about that today. We are actively uh, reviewing the evidence right now with the provinces and territories. We'll have more uh, specific recommendations in a very sh short time frame. In the meantime, countries like the United States have already put out their own guidelines, and that's leaving many in this country confused about what they should or shouldn't do. So we'll get to this with our nightly question and answer session with doctors in just a moment. But first, we asked Dr. Samir Gupta to break down what we do know and the precautions that you should be taking if you do choose to wear a mask. Let's start with how a mask might help. So most importantly, you might actually have the coronavirus and not even know it, in which case wearing a mask will actually protect other people from catching it from you by blocking your infected droplets coming out of your mouth and nose. The mask might also protect you from other people's droplets, and it might also prevent you from touching your mouth and nose with your hands, which could easily have become contaminated by touching any infected surface. But there are pitfalls. So the mask doesn't cover your eyes where the coronavirus can also get in. And a lot of people don't use these masks properly. So the whole idea is that if the mask is blocking those infected droplets, then the coronavirus is sitting on the surface of the mask. So you've got to wash your hands before you put it on. You've got to wash your hands after you take it off. And you never touch the surface, which means doing things like this defeats the purpose. So what's the right type of mask? So this is an N95 mask. It's designed to block microparticles created during certain medical procedures. It's meant to be airtight, which means it has to be fitted to each person's face. Um, it gets hot and sweaty, uh, it can leave bruises. So if you're not a healthcare worker, you really shouldn't be wearing this kind of mask. This is a surgical mask. So this is designed to block those droplets and that's exactly what we want. This is a bandana. So this and other types of cloth masks will probably reduce transmission of your own droplets to others, but they're not designed to block other people's droplets. So if you use them, you still have to try to maintain that physical distance. So what should you do? Well, if you're sick, stay home and wear a mask to protect others around you. If you're not sick, I would say it depends. Um, ideally, don't leave your house, in which case you won't need a mask. If you do leave your house, try to stay six feet away from anyone else, in which case you also don't need a mask. But if you can't do either of those things, I think wearing a mask properly will reduce the chances of coronavirus transmission. So if you've got a medical grade mask, you can use it. If you don't have a mask and you want to get one, buy a cloth mask. But either way, you've got to use the mask properly, which means don't assume you're invincible, don't stop washing your hands, don't stop trying to physically distance, and always handle the mask as if it's contaminated with the coronavirus. Finally, don't forget that hospitals are running low on masks right now. So if you've got a supply of unused medical masks, ask your doctor how you can get those back into the healthcare system, because your providers desperately need them right now. Dr. Gupta, who, Gupta, who's a respirologist, and Dr. Lenora Saxinger, with an expertise in infectious diseases, are with us now to answer some of your questions. And we will continue with this uh, issue of the day, masks. We heard Dr. Tam say that public health officials in Canada are still reviewing the evidence right now and will make recommendations uh, shortly. And so different people, including different doctors, have, have different uh, views. So here's a question uh, from our audience. Should people wear homemade masks when they go outside? Dr. Gupta, you touched on it, but but let me ask you, like, why do you think that is what people should do? I think, you know, if you look at the messaging that's coming out from different agencies, our agency versus the CDC, people are confused because there are different messages out there. And a lot of that is because the scientific evidence is not that clear. You know, we need to be upfront about that. Uh, but there's scientific evidence, which will eventually hopefully come. But in the middle of a pandemic that's rapidly evolving, you sometimes just have to make some moves that are, that are pragmatic. Uh, so we know from sort of lab 
settings that these kinds of masks do reduce droplet transmission, including cloth masks. So the idea is to extend that uh, to, the, to the sort of public setting and also to, to accompany any messaging around people wearing masks with the warnings about what they don't protect from, which we sort of heard about in the video. So Dr. Gupta, you would wear a mask outside then? I would. I would wear a cloth mask outside. I, I would save the medical grade masks for when I'm at work, uh, but I would wear a cloth mask outside. But here's the interesting thing about this issue, right? Dr. Saxinger, there you are in, uh, in Edmonton and, and you have a different view. You, you wouldn't be wearing a mask outside. No, I don't think um, in most situations where people are outside in public right now, if they're observing social distancing, that a mask is likely to add much, um, as long as they're observing the social distancing, of course, and hand hygiene. So there's this unknown element of, is it helpful in that setting or not? Which makes me a little hesitant to say, I think everyone should do it. Um, the potential downsides were alluded to already in which um, if you touch the mask, um, and particularly actually, if you're doing that without proper hand hygiene, it actually might be a little bit of a risk. And there's even some data from uh, healthcare settings where cloth masks actually, people wearing the cloth mask had the highest risk of infection in one study compared to intermittent use of a surgical mask and a surgical mask. And so we haven't really excluded the possibility that they, they don't do anything at all. And a lot of the evidence for them is a little bit more laboratory based. So I'm hesitant to say, I think everyone must do it. Um, I do think that uh, if you're gonna be in closer quarters with people, the argument that it might reduce your likelihood of spreading infection to others, even if you don't yet know you're infected is a good one though. So I think it's a bit situational. And Dr. Gupta, you wanted to, to jump in. Yeah, you know, I think in many ways we actually agree. When I'm thinking about wearing a mask, it's really in settings where I can't physically distance. So if I'm going for a walk or a run, I wouldn't wear it. I'm really thinking about that location like a grocery store where I think it has value. All right, well, thanks to both of you because a lot of people are really troubled by this question and, and how they should conduct themselves. And of course, we will be asking your questions about COVID-19 each night going forward. So you can send those questions to us, message us directly on Instagram at CBC The National or send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. Confirmed cases around the world have now reached nearly 1.3 million. But as we've seen on the national, different countries have experienced very different outbreaks. From the healthcare crisis that Italy still faces from acting too late. We were the first, so we were totally unprepared. To Iran, as it fought the virus with propaganda, even as COVID-19 infected the highest ranks of government. The regime uh, was a disaster in the way it handled it. To Germany, which initially managed to blunt the force of the disease with preparation, testing, and a bit of luck. Chris Brown gives us a look now at Sweden, which is fighting COVID-19 with an unusual hands-off approach. Life still feels kind of normal in the Stockholm coffee shop, like it was before COVID-19. You can place your order and then chat with a friend, sitting a table or two away. So I feel like our customers are actually following the guidelines, so they are keeping the distance and uh, they are very like, uh, uh, not sitting so close to each other. Sweden has not done what most Canadian provinces have. There are no states of emergency, and businesses have not been ordered to close to enforce social distancing and halt the spread of the infection. Not only are some restaurants still operating, so are schools and daycares. I follow what the experts say, and, and uh, the, the people in charge, they, they take the decisions. And I'm, I, I, I feel that the, those measures are, are, are good for us here in, in Sweden. That idea of trusting each other and trusting the government is what Swedes believe set them and their COVID-19 strategy apart from others in Europe and the world. Deputy State Epidemiologist Anders Wallenstein is one of the policy's architects. There is culture and tradition. And, uh, and in Sweden, this is uh, the way we usually work and we continue to work with this during this crisis as well. Increasingly, though, Swedes are questioning whether something stronger than trust is needed. Professor Cecilia soderberg nockler is an infectious disease specialist, one of 2,000 prominent doctors who've signed a petition urging stronger measures. 
I think that uh, uh, all other countries that are closed down are going to be able to manage their healthcare problems better. The critics note Britain initially tried something similar and then abandoned the strategy when it became evident the healthcare system would be overwhelmed. And in Stockholm, that's what everyone is watching for now. In Stockholm, it's very hard pressure. So we are still struggling it's to stay ahead of the COVID pandemic. And so far, we have succeeded. But for how much longer? Sweden has seen a spike in fatalities, now with over three times more deaths per capita as Norway next door, which is essentially locked down. Uh, I am worried, yes, because uh, just now we've seen that uh, the virus has spread to a lot of homes for the elderly, and that's not a good situation. So yes, I am worried. It's going to take too long time, and the problem is that this virus is spreading so fast, which means that there are too many people that get sick at the same time and then you collapse, uh, you collapse the hospital, so it just doesn't go together. I usually say that this virus is more uh, a dangerous virus for the society than it is for the individual. This weekend there were signs of Swedish government's commitment to its outlier plan may be wavering. The cabinet has asked parliament for sweeping authority to impose strict lockdown type measures if it comes to that for Swedes to keep their distance. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. Next on the national, pivoting to fight the coronavirus. You know, a lot of, a lot of folks are being laid off and uh, it, it's an honor that we have an opportunity to put people back to work. How businesses are rapidly changing to manufacture desperately needed PPE. But first, coronavirus has forced us to reconsider how we do the simplest tasks. In tonight's COVID-19 how-to guide, Andrew asks, if you have to go somewhere, what's the safest way to get around? When you need to get somewhere and driving yourself isn't an option, which is the safer bet, public transit or calling a taxi or an Uber? Well, on the one hand, public transit involves mingling with the public. More people means more chance to get sick, even if you travel during off-peak hours, which, by the way, is what you should be trying to do when you go. On the other hand, in a car, you are in a much more confined space. So if the driver or a fellow passenger happens to be sick, then yes, you are that much more likely to get sick as well. Then again, on public transit, maybe you touch more things, the door, the turnstiles, the ticket machines, the handrails, the elevator buttons. But here's the thing, the most likely way to get sick isn't actually by touching things, it's by being around sick people. Averaged out, taking an Uber is probably safer, but once again, we come down to don't take trips you don't have to. And that's not true just for your own protection. Think of the driver and all the strangers they have to interact with. Some companies are donating their services in the war against coronavirus. Small businesses like Dillon's Distillery in Ontario and the Newfoundland Distillery Company, as well as big companies like Molson Coors and the parent company of the French perfume giant Givenchy. And it's not just hand sanitizers. Companies have started making medical gear as well, like ventilators and personal protective equipment. Here's how three Canadian operations have pivoted their production to make face shields. It's been a crazy ride, says the president of Inksmith. Just one month ago, this small company in Kitchener, Ontario, was making educational tech products, 3D printers, robotics kits. Today, it's retooled and re-energized, churning out medically certified face shields, and they're hiring. You know, a lot of, a lot of folks are being laid off, and uh, it, it's an honor that we have an opportunity to put people back to work and to do it in a meaningful way. Our jobs start at 18 bucks an hour and scale up from there, and we'll hire something like 150 to 200 people in the next two to three weeks. Everything is moving quickly. Hedges says their Health Canada license came with the fastest approvals ever. Soon they'll be producing 10,000 shields a day and will be opening a new facility. The parts can be disassembled, then sterilized, and that means it can be used up to 10 times. Inksmith calls its product the Canadian Shield. We're using all Canadian suppliers, so our supply chain is all in Canada. We're not at risk if, you know, if things change elsewhere, we're okay. We can keep manufacturing these. Currently, we are producing off a 3D printer, um, and this is the product of which we've developed here. It's a, uh, it's a face shield, which is for a droplet protection. 
Just outside Barrie, Ontario, MPC Molded Precision Components is also hiring. The auto parts maker is three weeks away from shifting production to 15,000 shields a day. Soon that will be up to 320,000. The retooling funded in part by a government grant. We're installing seven new molding machines to keep up to increase the capacity as fast as possible. Um, and that's a huge endeavor. We have eight weeks to basically develop an entire manufacturing, additional manufacturing facility in our warehouse, which includes like a big trailer generator, all the electrical, water hookups. It's, it's good. It's a massive endeavor. For Bauer, the transition from hockey visors to medical shields has been a little easier. Four days from brainstorming to prototype. Now they're producing 8,000 units a day at two plants, one in Quebec, one in the U.S. But overwhelmed by orders, they decided to put their plans on the internet, free for any company to copy. And that, in turn, has inspired an extraordinary team effort. Not all companies really can do all the things necessary for manufacturing, but what we found is just an influx of companies coming to us saying what they could do. They could provide components, they could do assembly, and what our engineers are now doing is working as facilitators to bring these companies together to then allow a different type of manufacturing that may take more than one company. At Inksmith, with every ring of the bell, another case of the Canadian Shield is ready to go. The toy tech company now fully transformed to medical supply manufacturer. We need a long-term manufacturing base in Canada so that the next time we have a crisis, we can protect ourselves. So we need to be able to make all of this equipment right here. And we'd love to hear more stories of Canadian companies turning their focus to making medical equipment and how it's going. So send us an email at thenational at cbc.ca. Next on the program. It's always busy. For the first time, we're not busy. Finding a silver lining. Meet people taking time to practice gratitude. But first. This is what the Vatican looked like last year on Palm Sunday, but today a very different kind of celebration, forced indoors because of the pandemic and closed to the public. Pope Francis addressed an almost empty St. Peter's Basilica. Around the world, the faithful have had to adapt their traditions with virtual masses, makeshift drive throughs and a little improvisation. In cities around the globe, it's become a nightly and noisy show of appreciation. A salute to healthcare workers, those on the front lines of this crisis. It's a message in different languages, offered in different ways, but all saying the same thing. Thank you. We know there's no shortage of fear in this pandemic, but we're also seeing an abundance of gratitude. As Joanna Romiliotis explains, it's a bit of a magic formula. By forcing much of the world to stay in, many are reaching out. The times are strange and unsettling. Yet in this forced retreat, there is a growing space to simply say thank you. Thank you for being a friend. Every day at 5 p.m., a street comes together with a different song, but it's always about gratitude. Ben Chan is a doctor. He altered the lyrics to acknowledge other frontline workers, like grocery clerks and mail carriers. We've sung songs about gratitude to healthcare workers, but there's a lot of other people out there that we need to be thankful about. From streets to screens, people are finding a way to show appreciation. Even in lighter spoofs, there's a deeper meaning. Roommates Devin Chuddy and Brighton Palka made that now viral video of friends and family to pass the time. <laughs> and are so glad they did. Just because we can't spend time together face to face, it's nice to do something where we can still connect over the phone or on video. And making videos like this, it's nice to see your friends uh, from across the country. We're all dealing with the same thing. 
and, and I feel like we we could put a smile on people's faces with this video and uh, we hope it we continue to do that gratitude seems to be the flip side of fear it's less about denial more about reflection while our world as we knew it is on pause having activities to do so we're not bored all day and having food and water and being thankful for your family that's the most important Maybe melissa ozil atwil encourages her daughters to write down what they're grateful for being thankful for your food yeah food so those are moment? moments that they wouldn't have time necessarily during a regular scheduled day, right? They go to school, they come back, I cook dinner. It's always busy. For the first time, we're not busy. So we're really trying to maximize our time together, make it fun, play lots of family games, be silly, and kind of loving being part of a family that cares about each other and wants to be with each other. The forced distance from others is an opportunity to go inward and give thanks in other ways. Through the power of social media and technology, there's actually so much that we can do to mobilize others in expressing our gratitude in concrete ways. Fashion designer Kim Smiley runs the Empathy Effect, a nonprofit movement that promotes acts of kindness. She launched an online challenge asking people to hail heroes among them. There have been thousands of nominations already. I think because people are slowing down, it's allowed them to get outside of their heads in order to see what's going on around them. And I think that has allowed light to be reflected on people who are doing these incredible works, these, these heroes, these health heroes, these other frontline workers. And more are chiming in to support those workers. Like many new rituals, it's sustenance for shaken souls and stalled lives. People on this street now light candles every night. Letitia Kaliri came up with the idea. It's an exercise in grace in finding the light in every day, however hard it may be to get through one. It's not easy. It's not easy. It's really bad what's happening, and uh, I know it costs a lot of lives, but um, the only way that I can see and I can go through this in a bright light, it's seeing like we need a pause. The world is pausing. It's a time to uh, rethink everything, our values, our way of life, and uh, slow down and enjoy what we have most important inside of four walls, our family, our loved ones, and whatever we can do like to support each other. A reminder that lives now suddenly smaller have room to be filled with so much more. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. We have another story of gratitude in our moment just ahead, but first. Take a look at this video. Gurdip Ponder and his neighbor Jordan, they live in Yukon, as they say, out in the wilderness. They're practicing physical distancing while also creating a Canadian cross-cultural moment. Even keeping two meters apart can't stop you from making a little magic. The Toronto skyline featured these lit up hearts to show the city's gratitude to frontline workers last night. And it caught the attention of Dr. Samir Sinha, who tweeted, I stopped the car and wept last night. Thank you to my city of Toronto and its citizens for these acts of love that are keeping its frontline health workers going. Dr. Sinha's reaction and his message to Canada is our moment. Coming home at the end of a long day, and just seeing a, uh, like an act of love. It was just so lovely. For all of us who are at the front lines, uh, for me as a geriatrician where I care for and I've dedicated my life caring for the population that COVID um, is absolutely brutal for, 
um, you know, we're worried. We're worried about each other, our, our, our own healthcare colleagues. We're worried about our patients. Uh, we're worried about the country. And there's a lot of anxiety. And uh, amongst us, uh, we're trying to continue our routine care and make sure that our regular patients are okay. Um, and we don't want to make mistakes. So we have all of that wearing on us. If you have an older person in your neighborhood, look out for them. You know, my friends have been great because they know I'm not eating much these days. So, um, you know, what do I get? I now get a ready-made meal to make sure I eat. So look after your, each other. And if you've got a senior in your life, you know, seriously, reach out. Don't touch them, but reach out and look out for them too. So you may have seen that interview earlier today. Rosemary Barton did it on uh, CBC News Network. She's been doing so well each morning with uh, the live specials with the Prime Minister's uh, message. Also interesting to get a peek inside uh, the reaction from healthcare workers. I've been wondering if they have been seeing these messages of gratitude and if they've been appreciating them, and clearly they have. That is The National for Sunday, April the 5th. Good night.